All right, we're talking about scientific frauds. Last time we introduced you <clears throat> to Archaeopteryx and uh, Piltdown Men. Let's take a look at Neanderthal. You know, I just saw a Neanderthal picture. It was on Nova just this year on Nova. Neanderthal was discovered back in 1856, I believe it was, over in Germany. He, <clears throat> at the time, was not looked at as being some half-man, half-ape, because that was three years before... Uh, Charles Darwin wrote his book on Origin of Species, but during the during the 1870s, some French guy over there said, "Hey, hey, we got a we got a skeleton over here. Let's uh, take a look at this and see if we can't fit this in to Darwin's Darwin's uh, Origin of the Species." And sure enough, they did. And so, as as time went on, you know, there was some controversy about uh, Neanderthal. Now, I can remember Neanderthal when I was in high school. Archaeopteryx and Neanderthal were kissing cousins. And they were part and parcel. I, I didn't know that Neanderthal was a fraud, though. Now, Neanderthal wasn't a fraud like Javaman. They actually have more than one skeleton of Neanderthal. There's a, there's a bunch of them. And they came to find out that this Neanderthal skeleton over here, he's not some kind of a brute. He's a, he's a guy that had arthritis. Yeah, he, he, he was debilitated. He was handicapped. And uh, probably needed a wheelchair. I don't know whether he had one or not, but he probably needed one. And... Uh, they took that and they, they uh, made an artist's conception of what he looked like. Now, an artist can make these bones look like a brute or like a uh, college professor. You know, whatever they want to do, they can just, just draw it up over the bones. I mean, after all, if you can put hair color and, and uh, the texture and, and uh, the waves or the, or the straights, you know, into a hair on a, on a Java man, why can't you make Neanderthal look any way you want him? And that's what they do. They have these artists' conceptions. And people believe it. <clears throat> they look at I believed it. Hell, when I saw this Neanderthal, I said, now, that, that ain't a half, uh, half ape, half man. I don't know what is. That's what, <clears throat> that's what they needed to depict, and that's what they drew up, and that's what I saw, and that's what I believed when I was in the 10th grade. I, I bought the whole story hook, line, and sinker. I didn't have any reason not to. After all, my mommy and daddy sent me to public school, and the public school teacher showed me the pictures. Now, why would I doubt mommy and daddy and my, my teachers, huh? Now, as it turns out, I was lied to. <clears throat> and Nova is still perpetuating that lie, or perpetrating that lie, today. Today, as I speak. But fortunately, <clears throat> the uh, guy that wrote the book here that we're reviewing here, Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith, Don Boys, he went into some other books and other sources and said, hey, hey, hey. Let me reveal this to you. You didn't know this, but uh, this Neanderthal, or Neanderthal, well, Neanderthal has become a well-used word in the English language. It's often used to denigrate Christians or conservatives because of our antiquated views. The word carries with it the idea of crudeness, ignorance, and lack of sophistication. Why you Neanderthal? You ever heard that used? In other words, a Neanderthal was not much of a man, maybe just half a man. And most people make a big deal about Neanderthal man, who was first found in Germany in 1856 with a brain capacity larger than modern man. you believe that? Larger. So we've been degenerating. Yet he was depicted as a barrel-chested, uh, hairy, brutish, stooped person, intermediate between ape and man. Maybe the original big city mugger. Now, we know otherwise. He was not ape man, but he was a man with arthritis and rickets who buried his dead with ceremony, in, in indicating some kind of religious belief, and he was a skilled craftsman. He made tools. Anthropologist A. Montague of Princeton University agreed. He said, quote, Owing to want of a little knowledge of elementary anatomy, some of these authorities who have engaged in reconstruction of Neanderthal man have represented him with a bull neck, grotesque features, and walking with a stoop. Now, it has also often been asserted that Neanderthal man must have been of low intelligence because he had a low forehead. All these slanders are indefensible." Unquote. As early as 1864, the German anatomist Meyer called attention to Neanderthal's physical problems in addition to being dead. And in 1872, Rudolf Virchow, father of modern pathology, boldly said that Neanderthal was not ancient, but a human who suffered from rickets. That was in the late 1800s. But the evolutionists didn't want to give up. Neanderthal, a so respected scientist, 
Marcelin Boulle, B-O-U-L-E, from the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, tried to reconcile the large brain capacity indicating advanced intelligence with him being a brutish man. Buell decided to use the pseudoscience of pharaonology using the bumps on the surface of the skull to judge intelligence and argued that yes Neanderthal had a large brain but it was inferior according to pharaonology. If bumps on the skull indicate intelligence then most evolutionists are old smoothies. So where did the statues and pictures showing a stumbling brute come from if Neanderthal was a full man who would not be looked at twice on the street tomorrow morning? All recent pictures depict him as a modern man, although stooped from arthritis and rickets. They were pulled from the minds of artists, after all. An artist can make Neanderthal look like a savage or a scholar, depending upon his bias. E.A. Hooten said that the alleged restorations of ancient types of men have very little, if any, scientific value, and that they are likely only to mislead the public. No doubt about that. By 1975, Neanderthal was recognized as fully human, so Neanderthal was not half man, half ape, or half connecting link, but he was a full man with a debilitating disease. So down goes another missing link. <clears throat> now in the Nova presentation, they did not mention a word about Neanderthal having rickets or arthritis. Not a word. This is chapter 18 of the book, Evolution, Fact, Fraud, or Faith. Fact, Fraud, or Faith. And it's written by a, a guy who is a creationist. And we'll take a look at how many of these creationists are there. Well, some of the biggest names in science were creationists. You know guys like Sir Isaac Newton and Louis Pasteur? I mean, you know, you take the big names like Kelvin and Watt and so on. These guys are, are, are not evolutionists. Why do you stretch the imagination? And, and they write books, and they have made scientific discoveries. And today, the science community, if you were to take a look at science, and then the scientists, and divide them up into evolutionists and creationists, they would divide out 5644. 5644. 56% of scientists believe in evolution. 44% believe in creation. Now, that's pretty close to 50-50. They're, they're only six percentage points apart. You know, 44 to 56, you know, is, is 12. But if 6 from the evolutionary side were to uh, change over to the creation side, we'd have a 50-50 split, wouldn't we? So it's pretty close to half and half. Now, the truth of the matter is, more of these scientists, of the 56% that claim to be evolutionists, see, that's an inflated number, inflated. And the reason that we know that is because if you're, a, if you're a science professor and you're teaching at Harvard or Yale or something like that, if you were to tell the truth that you really didn't believe in evolution, but you rather believed that creation was probably the better argument, see, you'd lose your tenure there, professor. And you know it as well as I do. You'd be drummed out of there like Emmanuel Velikovsky was. So in the past, whenever a a uh, history professor or a paleontologist or scien scientific type, you know, says, here's what I believe. If he doesn't follow the party line, he loses his job. So uh, right away, the people that say they believe in creation either have to be, one, we don't give a rat's you-know-what, or two, they're pretty safe in their job description or they'd claim to be evolutionists also. You know, nobody wants to lose his job. It's disruptive. And so they just tell you the party line. So if you're working for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and you're working on, you know, the Voyager space program or something like that, you know, the official party line is evolution. I mean, that's the, that's the story. It's the cover story. And uh, that's what we believe because that's what I have to believe in order to justify my job. And that's, that's why it's divided up 56-44. Otherwise, it would be probably... 60, 40 in the other direction, or maybe even better than that, as I'll show you as we progress along, because there's a lot of big-name guys right now today that tell you very plainly, hey, I, I, I don't believe in evolution. So it leads me to ask the question, well, if big names today tell you that they don't believe in evolution, well, are these guys Neanderthals? Are they fools, blind, stupid, archaic? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. So what we're dealing with here is philosophy, and philosophy is just that. It's uh, here's what we think. Here's, here's my philosophy on that point. Here's what I think. Here's my opinion, which is worth nothing. My opinion isn't worth anything. 
neither is yours. You're entitled to it. <clears throat> it's protected. It's free speech, but doesn't mean that it's true or false. doesn't mean jack squat. <clears throat> so going on here, evolutionists didn't want to give up Neanderthals, so respected scientists, now Marcellin Buell, B-O-U-L-E, comes along and he says, hey, listen, <clears throat> let's make this into what we want it to be. And they did. And it's being bandied about today, but by 1975, Neanderthal was recognized as being fully human. No missing link. Now, let's think about this for a second. Have you, have you ever thought about these, these uh, alleged missing links as just being varieties of human beings? You know, on planet Earth today, there's a bunch of people over in the Ituri rainforest of the old Belgian Congo. They're called pygmies. They're little black men, and they're barely four foot tall. Just little guys. And they look just like uh, other black people in Africa, but then you got some guys called Watutsis over there. They're about seven feet tall. Great big tall guys. So you got guys four to seven feet tall. They're, they're all black. Over in China, you got people over there that are barely five foot tall, and you got some that are seven. We got one here in the United States, plays basketball, Chinaman, seven foot tall. Do we say today that this seven foot tall Chinaman? evolved out of five-foot Chinaman, or that <clears throat> the seven-foot Chinaman today is evolving? No, we, we recognize him as being a Chinese guy that's seven-foot tall. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, you've got people that, <clears throat> that have large heads, and their brain capacity is larger than. Do we say that because people have larger brain capacity because their heads are bigger, that they're smarter. Hell, I know a lot of big-headed people that are dumb as a box of rocks, and so do you. So the size of your head doesn't make you smart or dumb. And you know, those are people that live right now on planet Earth. Some of them live in New Guinea, and they've got bones stuck through their nose. And some of them live in, in, in Rome and call themselves Catholics and work at the Vatican. I mean, come on. Now, when we pick up bones out of the ground, has it ever occurred to us that instead of being three races, that years ago there might have been five or 15 races, and that we're looking at different types of human beings? Has anybody ever thought of that? Well, I have, and so I just thought I'd throw that out to you. There's a lot of different varieties of people today, and one isn't evolving from the other. We don't say that we evolved out of pygmies in Africa now, do we? I mean, we, we haven't got to that point yet, have we? And then off to the side is the Bible. And this is the one that, you know, a little later on, we're going to, we're going to take a look at this. Because uh, the evolutionists say, well, the reason we reject religion and the Bible is because the Bible says the world is flat. No, 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 no. The Bible says the world is round. In fact, it says it's a sphere. It's religious people that said it was flat. It wasn't the Bible that said that at all. It was Jimmy Swaggart and the Pope and five other guys over there. They were lying about and misrepresenting God in the same way that these scientists are misrepresenting God in the creation. You know, they say, hey, this creation story is religious. There's nothing religious about Genesis 1, 2, and 3. That's science. The Bible is a science book. Got that? I know. You've heard all your life the Bible is not a, is not a treatise on science. That's a lie. The Bible is full of science. The Bible has the atomic theory in it, for crying out loud. The atomic theory in the scripture. Meteorology is in the scripture. There's all kinds of science in the Bible. <clears throat> it's the religious guys teamed up here with the politicians and the scientists that have said that the Bible isn't a science book. That isn't what God said. It's the scientists, the evolutionists, and the politicians, and the theologians that said the world is flat. It wasn't God. It wasn't the Bible that said that. So that's why I like to kind of separate myself both from the evolutionists and the creationists. Now, the creationists do have this much straight, and that is that the creation story in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is true, accurate, and correct. Evolution's as phony as a $3 bill. But not everything that the evolutionist says is phony. So he comes along and gives you 80% truth. We found these bones, and here's where we found them. And then he doctors it up with an artist's sketch of Neanderthal. 
and then deceives us by telling us that, hey, this is a missing link between something and man. And then when it's all ironed out, we find out, you know, after 200 years or 100 years or 50 years, we find out, oh, oh, wait a minute, that wasn't the way that was at all. That's a lie. 